promise. Um, you typically have to uh, start to engage almost with a commercial partner because you need a process, a GMB process, so GMB stands for good manufacturing practice, a GMB process to make the vaccines in the right quality. You have to do formal preclinical studies and toxicology studies, which takes two to four years usually. Um, then uh, at some point, if the preclinical data looks good enough, um, the decision is made to move into a phase one study, which was already relatively um, uh, relatively expensive. Phase one studies are there for testing initial safety. They take one to two years. Once the phase one study results are there, usually uh, you look at the results and then there's a long decision process to find out if you want to go to phase two, which also takes about two years. And then there is really a re-evaluation. A lot of vaccines die in phase two because the the step to phase three is extremely expensive. This is where um, most of the money uh, is needed. And in phase three, you really then see if the vaccine is safe in a large, uh, large cohort and if it's eff efficacious in a large cohort. And that's very important. Once that data is in, um, you submit a, a biologic license, biologics license application to the FDA. And then it usually takes another one to two years until your vaccine is licensed. And only then, if everything goes right, you start large-scale production uh, of your vaccine. So this is about, uh, I would say, 15-year-long process on average. Now, what happened now with SARS-CoV-2 uh, is that we already had a lot of data in terms of uh, design and uh, exploratory preclinical experiments from experience with sars coronavirus one and mers coronavirus. So this step was basically skipped as soon as the sequence was uh, available of the virus, which was, which was on January 10th. Um, and then there were a lot of processes that were already uh, developed. Um, and so um, in some cases, even the toxicology studies, uh, for example, with Moderna were skipped and this, um, this first part uh, was really um, shortened to uh, very few months. And then phase one st uh, studies started. Moderna was the first one to start one in April. Um, and they basically were set up in a way that the phase one study would uh, move directly in the phase two study. So as soon as initial safety was established, more people were recruited. And then what we see now is that overlapping phase three studies start. So the phase one, two studies are still ongoing. They are not finalized yet, but phase three already starts. And the companies that produce these vaccines are producing the vaccine already for the market at risk. So if it turns out that the vaccine is no good, they did all of that uh, basically um, for nothing and lose all the money that they invested, but they are, uh, they are willing right now to, uh, to do this. And um, it's not clear how the, uh, the regulatory review will happen here, but it's uh, very likely that there's an expedited pro a process on a rolling basis. And also the idea of emergency use authorizations are, uh, are discussed. And this has been done at one point before with a meningitis B vaccine with Bexera. And so what that will do is it basically shortens this whole 15 year process to 10 months to 1.5 years. Now, there, although this is really moving forward with, uh, at very, very high speed, there is a number of issues that need to be kept in mind. The first one is that some of the front runner, runner companies that make these vaccines like Moderna and Novavax have never ever produced a vaccine for the, uh, for the market. So it's not clear how well they will scale this up and it's not clear how well they will do in producing a lot of these, uh, of these doses. And the same is true for some of the technology that is used. Uh, as you will see in a minute, a lot of the vaccines are based on RNA or DNA or viral vectors. And basically none of those have been, have been licensed for use in humans so far, uh, except the, the inactivated vaccines, for example, that, that are uh, developed by Sinovac. Um, the distribution will also be a challenge because it's not clear how the vaccines will be distributed and then administered because you would need to administer those vaccines to about 330 million Americans. We're just talking about the US and more than 8 million people globally. So how are we going to do that? And that's not going to be easy. 
Also, it's not clear yet who is getting the vaccines first. I haven't heard any public discussions about uh, which segments of the population should be vaccinated with the first batches. It's likely that that's going to be high risk uh, individuals and healthcare workers, but this is not clear yet either. And also to keep in mind, uh, immunity often uh, takes time to build up. And uh, as you will see, these vaccine approaches take two shots. So uh, even when once the vaccine is rolled out, it will probably take weeks to months until people actually are immune from uh, or protected from infection. And I, I can't stress this uh, enough. Uh, CEPI, uh, which is one of the uh, institutes internationally that organize the production of these vaccines for, on a global scale, um, has announced that they found production capacity for at least 2 billion doses for the year 2021. 2 billion doses sounds a lot, like a lot, but we probably need 16 billion doses globally. And so um, even if we can produce 2 billion doses in 2021, uh, this is far from what we actually need. Uh, again, keep in mind if we need two doses of the vaccine, which is extremely likely, we need 660 million doses just in the United States. Um, and so I just wanted to review the technologies a little bit that I used. Um, the first one is RNA vaccines. You have probably heard about these vaccines. Um, Moderna, for example, is developing an RNA vaccine. And in this case, you just provide the uh, messenger RNA that um, codes for the antigen, in most cases, the spike protein. Um, in a lipid nanoparticle and your own cells make that spike protein and then you get an immune response against, uh, against the spike and against the virus. Um, so there are a lot of advantages of this technology. Uh, specifically, there's no infectious virus needed um, and it's a, a process that hopefully can get scaled uh, nicely. But again, there have been no vaccines based on RNA that have been licensed. So we lack the experience to work with those vaccines. Uh, similar, we have DNA vaccines, which also code for the, um, for the antigen, uh, which then is expressed by your own cells. Again, this is very safe. And we also know that this can be scaled uh, quickly um, because uh, plasmids that are used for this can be grown in bacteria. Uh, the problem here is that if you want to have a good immune response, you need specialized delivery devices, usually electroporators, and that's the bottleneck. Uh, then we have recombinant protein vaccines. Um, vaccines like that are on the market for influenza, HPV and HPV. Um, and they seem to be safe. Uh, there is a, a number of companies that now develop these recombinant protein vaccines for SARS-CoV-2, but it's not clear what the global production capacity is and making spike protein is not easy. The yields are not very high. Uh, then we have these viral vector vaccines. Um, two of them uh, have been licensed so far, both of them for Ebola. One uh, is based on the uh, vesicular stomatitis virus. The other one is based on adenovirus that was just licensed uh, in July uh, in Europe. And so there is limited experience with licensing uh, these vaccines and producing these vaccines uh, for the market. Um, AstraZeneca, for example, is a, uh, a company that has developed uh, vectored vaccines for SARS coronavirus 2, and we'll get into that data. Then there's life attenuated vaccines. Uh, typically, you attenuate viruses by either passaging them at, uh, um, uh, at conditions that uh, don't resemble uh, the human body anymore, for example, at lower temperature. That takes a long time or you can actually rationally design life attenuated vaccines by taking away uh, essential genes for, bet, uh, for, for bet, uh, better genesis. Um, but also that is not so easy for SARS coronavirus too, because it's a huge virus genome and it's actually not so easy to manipulate. And then we have inactivated vaccines, which are very straightforward. Basically for those types of vaccines, you just grow the virus you kill it by adding formalin or better propiolactone or by UV irradiation. Um, and then uh, you can use that virus and just inject it with or without an, uh, an uh, adjuvant. The problem here is that you need for, in order to grow SARS coronavirus 2, uh, you need a biosafety level three facility. And there is very few uh, facilities globally that can produce vaccine at biosafety level three. 
uh, but I'll also show you some data for, for some of these candidates. Um, there is a tremendous amount of, uh, tremendous number of vaccine candidates in the pipeline. So what I'm showing you here is uh, the uh, candidates that are in preclinical uh, development, meaning they made it to the animal model stage. And here we have 51 protein vaccines in development, uh, 20 that are based on non-replicating vectors, 18 based on replicating vectors, uh, 16 RNA vaccines, 12 virus-like particle vaccines, 11 DNA vaccines, nine inactivated uh, vaccines, and unfortunately only three life attenuated vaccines. So it seems that making these vaccines is relatively hard. And there's very few candidates. I'm not going through all these candidates. I just wanted to mention four, which I think are very promising and should be mentioned. One is a life attenuated vaccine that is produced by Codogenics, uh, which is a company on Long Island. They produce this together with Serum Institute of India, which is a huge uh, vaccine producer in India. Um, and this is based on codon de-optimization. Another one is a recombinant spike protein that is made by Sanofi Pasteur, and they will use an adjuvant uh, that is made by GSK. I'm mentioning that because it's made in the same process as uh, one of Sanofi Pasteur's flu vaccines. So it's very likely that that, uh, that, pro, uh, that uh, uh, vaccine will actually hit the market. Another one I wanted to mention is a uh, measles vector vaccine that's developed by Themis. Um, and that company now got acquired by Merck. I'm mentioning that because a similar vector is actually in phase three for chikungunya. And it seems that uh, this is working very well. So um, it's very likely that it, might all, that it will also work out for SARS coronavirus too. And then of course, we have the um, Newcastle disease virus based approach with, which is both a life attenuated and an inactivated vaccine approach and that's developed by Peter Belisi's laboratory here at Mount Sinai. And that's also a very interesting approach. If we then go to, to uh, candidates that are in the clinic, we have 22 candidates in clinical developing, development right now for non-replicating vectors. Uh, five are inactivated vaccines and all of them uh, except one are developed in China. Three are RNA vaccines, four are DNA vaccines, two are based on the RBD protein, so that's part of the spike, and uh, four are based on uh, full-length spike protein. And of those, six are already in phase three clinical trials, two are in phase two, um, 10 are in phase one, two trials, and one, uh, four are in phase one trials. And just to show you how they are distributed globally, uh, we have seven candidates in clinical trials in China, five in the US, three in Europe, two in India, two in Australia, and then uh, one in Russia, one in Korea, and one in Japan. Um, so it looks very promising. There's a ton of candidates that are already in the, in the clinic. Uh, this is very unusual. Um, basically eight months after, after uh, the virus emerged, we already have vaccines that are in phase three clinical trials. Um, what I wanted to uh, touch briefly is correlates of protection. Um, and that's something that's going to become important when we go into the actual vaccine candidates. So for many vaccines, we have what we call a correlate of protection. It's typically a type of antibody that is measured in serum. And uh, if you have enough of that type of antibody, then that indicates that you're protected. We have that for hepatitis A and hepatitis B. Uh, we have that, for example, for influenza, where a one to 40 titer in serum uh, in this HIS is, is giving you a 50% increased protection. Uh, we also have that for measles, where it's a one to 120 titer. So we don't have these correlates of protection for SARS coronavirus 2 yet, and it will be very important to establish them. But we already have some data uh, from non-human primates <clears throat> that tell us what to look out for. And that's what I'm showing here. On the left side, you see an experiment where uh, non-human primates were infected with SARS coronavirus 2. And so here you see the uh, replication or, or the, the um, RNA copy numbers of virus in the lung of these animals. 
and on the right side you see when uh, what happens is you reinfect these animals. They're basically protected from reinfection. There's some RNA that you can find in some animals, but that's not even clear if that is replicating virus. It might, might just be the challenge virus. So we know that uh, you can protect at least animals from reinfection. And uh, this was done in, in uh, Dan Baruch's group. And they did another, uh, another study where they actually vaccinated animals. And the vaccine that, that they used was a DNA vaccine. It gave very variable results, which in this case was very interesting and good. So some animals had a lot of neutralizing activity um, in their serum, other animals very little. And so they could do a correlation analysis between neutralizing antibodies in serum and protection of the animals, specifically in the lower respiratory tract from virus. And they saw that there was a very, very nice correlation between neutralizing antibodies and protection from virus. And so at least for non-human primates, uh, correlative protection has already been established. Uh, they did not see any correlation between protection and CD4 or CD8 D cell counts. And so that's why what I will show you is that all these manuf uh, vaccine manufacturers when they do their clinical trials, they really focus on neutralizing antibody titers. You'll see that in a few slides. Um, I, I wanted to say also a few words about the expectations. What type of immunity do we want to achieve? Um, there might be different things that we, we expect from a vaccine. The question is, do we, do we want to have protection from infection, which is really hard to achieve, protection from disease, or protection from severe disease. And different people have different ideas of what is important. What I wanted to point out is that um, the upper respiratory tract uh, is mostly protected by secretory IgA1, while the lower respiratory tract is mostly protected by IgG. And so if you get an injected, an intramuscular or intradermal vaccine, you make a lot of IgG, but you basically do not make secretory IgA1. So I wanted to kind of uh, set the expectations a little bit that a lot of the vaccines that will be injected intramuscularly might not completely protect from infection in the upper respiratory tract, which might basically lead to protection from disease, but it might not lead for, to protection from infection. And that's something really important to keep in mind uh, to manage our expectations. And so what I'm showing you here in this very busy table are the results from non-human primate studies with some of the front runner vaccines. And I'm going to walk you through that slowly. Uh, so the first one is uh, a vaccine that's produced by Sinovac in China. They initially named this Bicovac, and it's an inactivated vaccine that is adjuvanted with aloe. They gave three to six micrograms uh, to the monkeys, um, and they gave it three times. When they gave it the first time, they didn't see any neutralizing activity. They gave it the second time, they saw some. This is a very low titer. And if they boosted another time, uh, they got a, uh, titers, neutralizing antibody titers in the 1 to 100 range. Um, they didn't look at diesel, or they didn't see diesel responses. And then after the second dose of the vaccine, uh, they challenged with 10 to the 6 DCID50 of virus intratracheally. And so what they found was that the lung was basically completely protected from infection, but they didn't test the upper respiratory tract, which makes sense because the challenge was done intratracheally. And um, so it's not clear if they would even have an infection in the upper respiratory tract. So that vaccine was okay in monkeys. Uh, the, uh, the, the data is not that excited exciting, but it seemed to, to protect. The next one is the vaccine candidate from AstraZeneca that's more relevant because that might actually be available uh, on the US market at some point. Uh, this vaccine is based on a chimpanzee adenovirus, um, adenovirus 1 that is expressing the spike protein. In the monkey experiments, uh, 2.4 times 10 to the 10th virus particles were given once or twice intramuscularly. And uh, after the first dose, they don't get much neutralization. After the second one, it increases a little bit. Uh, and they also found a uh, relatively good D cell response, but they didn't uh, actually differentiate between, uh, between CD8 and CD4. And then they challenged with actually four times 
400,000 uh, DCID50 via the intertracheal, oral, intranasal, and ocular route. And then they challenged. So they did that after the prime, and they also challenged animals that got a boost. And when you look at the, the upper respiratory tract, the animals that only got the prime are not protected from virus replication. So the virus just replicates like in naive animals. If you give the vaccine twice, you see a reduction of virus replication there. In both cases, the lungs were nicely protected. So you probably would have ended up with a, um, with a, a common cold-like infection, but no pneumonia. The next one is a vaccine candidate from Janssen, um, which is based on adenovirus 26 that also expresses the spike protein. So this adenovirus 26 was also used for an Ebola vaccine, which was just licensed in Europe. So uh, there is a counterpart that's already licensed for a different pathogen. They gave once 10 to the 11 virus particles and then saw a, one to, a neutralizing data in a 1 to 100 range. Um, they didn't observe much of a T-cell response, and when they uh, challenged with 10 to the 5th DCID50 intranasally and intratracheally, they had uh, almost uh, complete protection in the upper respiratory tract. There was some virus replication, but not very, very much, and they protected the lungs nicely, even after one vaccination. But the problem is that at 26 is a human virus, and so in humans, you might actually have pre-existing immunity to the vector, and it might not work as well. Uh, then we have the Moderna vaccine, which is based on uh, messenger RNA. Uh, it's called uh, mRNA-1273. And they gave uh, different doses, all of them twice. Um, when they give this vaccine once, they get, depending on the dose, uh, titers of 1 to 60 to 1 to 300. And if they boost, they actually get to pretty high titers, uh, ranging from uh, 1 to 100 to 1 to uh, 1800. Uh, in parentheses here, you see the titers in a different neutralization assay, and they also found uh, relatively strong T-cell responses, mostly CD4. And then they challenged with 7.5 times 10 to the fifth, also intranasally and intertracheally. And if they give the lower, uh, the lower dose, they don't see protection in the upper respiratory tract, but for the higher dose, there's very little virus replication, and the lungs are protected in, in both cases. And then Novavax um, recently uh, published a press release, uh, not just a press release, actually a PowerPoint presentation with data from their non-human primate uh, experiments. And so they have a recombinant spike that forms uh, little rosettes. And uh, they adjuvant that with Matrix M, which is a saponin-based adjuvant. And they gave uh, different doses, 2.5 micrograms up to 25 micrograms of that twice. Um, and they only showed the neutralization titers after the boost, and they end up in the 1 to 10,000 range. So that's the highest that I've seen so far. Um, and then they challenge, and they see protection in the upper and lower respiratory tract. Now, there's two things that I want to point out here. The challenge dose is different, and Novavax actually had the lowest challenge dose and got the best protection in the upper respiratory tract. And um, these neutralization titers are done with very different assays. And uh, uh, if Ben Hurley is in the audience, he can tell you more about that. But some of these are IC50 titers. Some of these are IC90 titers. Um, and so it's really hard to compare them. Uh, again, they're all done with, uh, with real virus, but the methods are very different. And so, um, now I wanted to show you the, the results from the initial clinical trials. Uh, a lot of them have been published very recently. Uh, actually, the first one that I'm showing you here, the one from Sinovac was published uh, yesterday on MedArchive. Um, and so this is data from um, Sinovac's CoronaVac. They changed the name between the animal studies and the, the clinical trials. So this is again an inactivated SARS coronavirus 2 vaccine. They grow the virus, they inactivate it, and then they adjuvanted with alum, and they give three or six micrograms of that uh, virus. In, uh, in this study, they gave it at day zero and day 14, or day zero and day 28. Intramuscularly, they had uh, 600 participants, and the age range was 18 to 59. 
and so um, what you can see here in the upper panel are the titers that they uh, get after they give the three microgram dose twice. Just look at the right two uh, graphs. Um, the data in humans are relatively low, so we end up in a 1 to 25 range here for the, uh, for the 0 014 schedule and a little bit higher for the 0 028 schedule. So it seems that it's better if you space it out a little bit more. And the different colored bars here indicate um, basically the age range of the individuals. They stratified it, which I like a lot. And it shows you one of the problems that we might run into with some of these vaccines. Uh, young people tend to respond very well, and the older you get, uh, the worse your response to the viruses or to the vaccine is in terms of neutralizing it. Put your head on my chest. Um, and then on the lower part, uh, you see the six microgram dose, and it's basically the same. There's not that much difference in terms of the neutralizing titers. Maybe in the 028 schedule, they're a little bit higher. So the data shows that they get neutralizing activity, but it's not really fantastic. Uh, what is very nice is their safety data. Um, and this is, again, for the two schedules. Um, the three bars here are always the, uh, the, uh, the two different doses and then the placebo. And as you can easily see here, uh, there was very little in terms of side effects. Uh, basically, fever comparable to the placebo, fatigue, uh, maybe some, uh, some pain. Um, but specifically, the, in the day 28, uh, zero, 28 schedule, there was almost no side effects. Um, and that's something special because you will see with the other uh, vaccine candidates, that's certainly not the case. Uh, the next one is CanSino. Um, this is also a Chinese vaccine candidate uh, that's based on adenovirus 5. Um, and what I'm showing you here is uh, phase 2 data. They are currently in phase 3. They also got licensed to use their vaccine in the Chinese military. And so, again, this is an adenovirus uh, type 5 that is expressing the spike protein. They tested two different doses, 5 times 10 to the 10th virus particles and 10 to the 11th virus particles. They gave a single shot intramuscularly, uh, and they did that in uh, 508 individuals, um, and uh, they only specified that the volunteers were 18 years or older. And what you can see here is um, neutralizing antibodies on the left side against the real virus and on the right side against the pseudotype particle uh, uh, neutralization assay. And you can see that uh, for both vaccine doses, we get approximately the same uh, GMDs, which are around 20. So this is not really that great. Um, and they also measured T cell responses and they see that uh, they get uh, relatively strong D cell responses, which is something that's uh, expected with an adenovirus uh, vector. Uh, again, relatively low neutralizing titers, uh, but certainly a D cell response. Um, if you look at uh, the, um, the safety, uh, there's nothing that really stands out as, as, as a problem, but you can see that specifically in the high dose, 30% of uh, participants develop fever, 30% develop a headache, 40% uh, uh, develop fatigue. So there's a relatively large percentage of, of side effects uh, that are present here, which I guess is what you would expect for an, uh, an adenovirus vaccine at that dose. Um, the next candidate is uh, from the University of Oxford, which was then picked up by AstraZeneca, but is also produced by Serum Institute of India. Um, it has different names. They initially called it JADOX NCOV-19. Um, and I think the final name now is Covishield. Um, this data is from a phase 1-2 trial. Uh, they did not, they included uh, more than 1,000 individuals, but they did not analyze the immune response of all of them. Uh, they gave 5 times 10 to the 10th virus particles. And again, this is a chimpanzee adenovirus, so there's little pre-existing immunity in humans. And this virus or this vector also expresses the spike protein. They tried to give the virus once or twice. If they gave it twice, it was on day one and day 28. It's given intramuscularly. Um, and here are the neutral, neutralizing titers that they get uh, after either the prime only or the prime and the boost. Uh, and they did that actually in different assays. So it's a little bit confusing and a little bit complicated. 
Um, but basically what you can see is that they already get uh, low neutralizing titers after one vaccination. Um, and the titers don't actually increase much after the boost um, in all individuals, but you see that it's becoming more homogeneous. But in the end, depending on the assay, you end up in a one to 20 range, or if you use uh, the second uh, setup of assay, uh, you en end up in a approximately one to 250 neutralizing data range. Uh, but again, this shows you how difficult it actually is to compare between different assays. Um, and then in terms of D cell responses, um, they found relatively good D cell responses. Again, that's something that you would expect from an adenovirus uh, vector vaccine. Um, for safety, they did something very nice. Uh, they used the meningococcal vaccine for the, uh, instead of a placebo group, so you can compare it to an actual vaccine. Um, and uh, a part of the vaccinees got paracetamol right away. Uh, because I guess they were expecting side effects and another part didn't get uh, paracetamol. Uh, it didn't help. The side effects look very, uh, very similar in both groups and they're certainly stronger than uh, in the control group with the licensed vaccine. Uh, again, we have fever in, in, in some individuals, we have fatigue, we have headache, and there was also a local uh, reactogenicity. Uh, again, nothing that really stands out, but uh, you see that there is a lot of rectogenicity. Um, then we have Pfizer, um, which partnered with BioNTech, which is a German uh, biotech company, and they produced uh, several candidates. The first one they moved to the clinic was BNT 162B1. Uh, this is an mRNA that expresses, in this case, the receptor binding domain of the spike and it's delivered in these um, uh, lipid nanoparticles, similar to what Moderna is doing. And so they released data from phase one, two trials with this BNT162B1. Um, the interesting thing is that they actually had a parallel trial with BNT162B2, which is the full length spike, and they're now moving that uh, forward into, into phase three trials and not the uh, construct that, uh, that they use to generate the data that I'm showing you here. Uh, they tested three different doses, 10, 30, or 100 micrograms, um, and uh, they gave it twice on day one and day 21. Intramuscularly, uh, they had 76 subjects here, in, and the age range was 18 to 55 years. Um, what I find interesting here is that actually uh, the prime with the messenger RNA doesn't give much uh, in terms of neutralizing titers. You see here you're in the 1 to 10, 1 to 30 range. But when you give the boost, you actually end up with a relatively high titer of, of uh, neutralizing antibody uh, in the 1 to uh, 100 to 1 to 300 range. Um, in the 100 microgram dose, uh, they did actually not give the boost because they already found a lot of rectogenicity after giving the prime. So they had a, a safety signal there and decided not to move forward. And just looking at the, at the data here of the medium dose and the high dose after the prime, it probably doesn't make a difference. And it's nice to compare this here also to uh, titers, neutralizing titers of convalescent uh, uh, COVID-19 patients. And you see that they're in the upper range of, of what they see with those patients. Um, again, in terms of, of uh, safety, um, they had a lot of uh, fever, specifically in the, uh, in the high dose group. Uh, you can see here uh, approximately 50% of the participants that got the 100 microgram dose developed fever, much lower in the 10 and 30 microgram dose, but we still have a lot of uh, side effects uh, in all of the groups after the prime and after the boost. Um, so again, it's not too concerning, but there's certainly rectogenicity. Um, then we have Moderna. Uh, Moderna partnered up with the Vaccine Research Center at NIH uh, with Barney Graham's group, um, and they developed what they call mRNA-1273, which is also an mRNA that's de delivered by uh, lipid nanoparticles, and they just released data from phase one, from their phase one trial, which started in April, they're also currently in phase three. And similar to Pfizer, they used three different doses, 2,500 and 250 micrograms, so a little bit on the higher side. 
they gave it twice on day one and uh, day 28 intramuscularly. And uh, they had in their phase one 45 participants between 18 and 55 years of age. And uh, similar to what uh, Pfizer saw, they had to uh, basically eliminate the highest dose because there was a lot of reactogenicity. But I'm showing you here the neutralization titers uh, for, for uh, the lower doses and in here also for the high dose. And you can see that similar to Pfizer, after the first dose of the vaccine, not much is happening. Uh, there is some neutralizing activity after the first dose, but not too much. So you certainly need a boost. And after the boost, they actually get uh, to levels of approximately 1 to 250, maybe 1 to 500. Uh, the upper panel here is a pseudo particle neutralization assay. Uh, this is uh, on the lower panel, we have titers with a uh, uh, Block reduction neutralization assay that's done with SARS, with actual SARS coronavirus 2, but they get very similar titers here. And this is for the two lower groups. They seem to be comparable, and those are the groups, uh, as far as I know, that move uh, forward right now. Um, they also looked at D cell responses. Um, we have four panels here. The upper panel uh, is D cell responses against uh, CD8 D cell responses against S1 on the left side and S2 on the right side. So these are the subunits of the spike. And you can see that there is not much in terms of CD8 uh, D cell responses. And um, this is also true for natural infection. Uh, Shane Crotty and Alex Sede uh, at La Jolla Institute of Immunology have shown that you get a lot of D cell, uh, D -cell activation uh, with SARS-CoV-2 infections, but not a lot of, uh, a lot of CD4, but not a lot of CD8 uh, activation. And then if you look at the CD4s, you see that the mRNA vaccine uh, is able to induce nice uh, CD4 responses against S1 and also against S2. So uh, certainly the CD4 response is there, which goes hand in hand, I think, with the, with the titers of antibodies that they see. Um, similar to what Pfizer saw, they, uh, they see uh, rectogenicity. Um, and interestingly, it's worse after the second dose than after the first dose. Uh, again, after the first dose, actually they didn't see any fever, but that came up after the second dose. Uh, and again, there is this uh, typical uh, symptoms that probably come from an interferon response like headache, uh, fatigue, fever, and so on and so forth. So again, nothing specifically to worry about, but certainly uh, some reactogenicity. And then uh, we have the last vaccine candidate and that data was also published, uh, I think, uh, late last week. Uh, that's Novavax. Um, Novavax produces uh, recombinant proteins in insect cells. They membrane extract them and then these proteins typically form uh, little rosettes and uh, Novavax calls them nanoparticles. And the data that we see here is from uh, phase one trial, where they used two doses, uh, 25 or five microgram of this recombinant protein, adjuvanted with a, an adjuvant called matrix M, which contains saponin. Um, and they give, gave that uh, on day one and 21, or they only gave uh, 25 microgram dose once. Um, they gave this intramuscularly, and this is from 131 individuals aged 18 to 59. And so you can see the neutralizing titers here. Um, and again, they have a comparison here to convalescent serum on the left side. And you can see that they get fairly high titers, even with their low dose of five micrograms, if they give it twice, they already go to uh, approximately one to 100 neutralizing titer after the, uh, after the prime. And then they shoot up to about uh, one to 3,000 to one to 4,000 uh, uh, neutralizing titers after the boost. And this is so far the highest titers that I've seen uh, in any of these clinical trials. Again, you have to take these comparisons with a grain of salt because the S's are different. This is certainly an IC50, while uh, other laboratories uh, performed S's that were based on IC80s, for example, Pfizer. Um, they also found a D-cell response, and again, uh, it's basically, <coughs> excuse me, uh, a CD4 D-cell response that they find, um, 
and they didn't report on any CD8 D cell responses. So it seems that with the adjuvant, uh, the, the um, vaccine is able to induce D cell responses. I forgot to mention this here. If you don't include the adjuvant, uh, the vaccine is actually doing very, very poorly. So we see that there is barely any neutralizing activity without the adjuvant. Um, and then in terms of, uh, in, in terms of uh, reactogenicity, uh, again, uh, there is reactogenicity, <clears throat> um, which is, I guess, uh, mostly driven by the adjuvant. Uh, we don't see much fever in this case, uh, but uh, fatigue and headache uh, are, seem to, uh, to be present at a relatively uh, large uh, proportion of, uh, of individuals. And just to sum all of this up, um, again, here at Davel, um, we have Sinovac, which uh, is a Chinese vaccine that's based on an inactivated SARS-CoV-2 with alum. Uh, they give that uh, three to six micrograms intramuscularly twice, uh, and they get relatively low neutralizing antibody titers. They didn't measure or didn't even look for a D cell response. Um, Ken Sino, which is now licensed to be used in the Chinese military, it's an adenovector vaccine um, that after one dose induced low neutralizing antibody responses, but gave a T-cell response. Uh, the AstraZeneca vaccine, which is uh, JADOX1 uh, with the spike, um, produced even after the prime, depending on the dose, an okay neutralizing antibody response while well, there was not too much boosting, uh, which might have to do with vector immunity. Uh, and they also saw a D cell response. So uh, this candidate looks relatively good to me. Um, then we have Pfizer, which used an mRNA vaccine at different doses twice. Uh, not really high neutralizing titers after the first uh, dose, but a pretty okay range after the second dose. Uh, they did not look at uh, D cell responses in that, in that study. Um, they might do that in other studies. Uh, we have the Moderna vaccine, which was also given in different doses as mRNA, and it performs very, very similar to what uh, to the Pfizer vaccine. Um, and they looked at these responses and saw for sure a robust CD4 T-cell response, but not really a CD8 T-cell response. And finally, we have Novavax, uh, which is uh, developing a vaccine based on uh, recombinant protein with matrix M adjuvant, uh, given at different doses, uh, 1 to 80 neutralizing data range after the prime, but a very high 1 to 3,000 to 1 to 4,000 neutralizing antibody range after the boost, and they certainly also got a CD4 D cell response. Again, the neutralizing data have to be taken with a grain of salt, but all in all, several of these candidates look very, very promising to me. So in conclusion, um, vaccines are currently being made at uh, record speed. Um, many candidates are in the pipeline and many candidates are already in the clinic. And I'm really happy about that because there's not a single vaccine producer right now that can really um, meet the demand of the market. So the more vaccines we have licensed, the more likely it is that the vaccines become readily avail available. Um, <clears throat> and um, of course, in phase three, a lot of vaccines fail usually. So if one or two of the candidates fail, we have alternatives. So it's really important to have, uh, to have diversity here. Uh, we see encouraging results from preclinical models and from phase one and two trials, um, but there's a lot of open questions that remain. Uh, the saying is the proof is in the pudding and here the pudding is really in the phase three trials. Um, so we'll see in the phase three trials if in a larger population there is actually efficacy and also safety. Those are very, both very important. Uh, the reactogenicity for most of these vaccine candidates is on the higher side, which is likely no problem for adults, but might be a problem for, uh, for children. And so it's not clear uh, how acceptable some of these vaccine candidates will be in children. Um, and another point that's not clear yet is what type of protection are we seeing? Uh, in, will we see in the, fa in the phase three trials? Is it going to be protection from disease, which in my, um, in my opinion uh, is uh, sufficient? Or is it going to be also protection from infection, which would lead to uh, complete, uh, break, um, complete inhibition of transmission? And in my opinion, it's very unlikely that we see that. 
Um, <clears throat> the last point that I wanted to make, you probably heard the news, uh, Russia licensed their vaccine after phase two. Uh, they are not even performing, or they haven't even performed the phase three trial yet. They don't know if it works or if it's safe, but they already start to use it. Uh, China is using a, a vaccine that hasn't been gone through a phase three trial in the military. But I think it's very important that we do not cut corners in terms of safety and efficacy. And I think we'll have to wait for uh, the first results from phase three trials to really make a judgment if a vaccine is safe and if it works. I think we can live with lower efficacy. Um, you know, a vaccine that, uh, that uh, reduces the disease severity or that protects, let's say, 50% of vaccinated individuals from, from infection would be already very, very nice. But I don't think we can cut any corners by in terms of safety and we cannot really take any risks there. And so we really have to rely on uh, the phase three trials and the FDA to, to review that data and then to make the decision of licensing a vaccine or not. And I think I'll end there. I just wanted to acknowledge a lot of people um, not because of the vaccine work, but the COVID work that we are doing in general, specifically my lab, but also uh, the huge team of, of people I'm working with at Mount Sinai. I'm very grateful to, to our uh, microbiology department. There was a lot of support during this pandemic uh, that really, especially specifically in the beginning, uh, helped us to build up resources and to, to get us going. Uh, I have a wonderful uh, collaboration with Viviana, Adolfo, Tom Moran, we have a vaccine pro uh, project with Peter. I work a lot now with uh, Anja Vanberg from, from the hospital side, um, Carlos, and also Adolfo Firpo uh, in, in, in pathology, and then also Harm von Barkel and Mio Sotilo. And uh, we had a lot of uh, international co collaborations as well. So I'll end there, and if there's still time, I'll, I'll take a question. Thank you so much, Florian. That was really um, informative. Um, I know that we are, um, Judy Aberg and her team at, in infectious diseases have a couple of studies um, the, um, about therapeutics, but also of, uh, about vaccines. Um, maybe Judy, you want to tell us about that? Yeah, I'll be really brief. Um, Florian, that was fantastic. So thank you so much. Um, I know there's a lot of questions on the chat. So just briefly, so everybody knows, we're opening phase three of the Pfizer vaccine. Um, and hopefully, if not this week, then on Monday, we've had a couple of delays, but Pfizer has now changed the dosing schedule to uh, two doses, 21 days apart. Um, that study is intended to go through the end of August. From right at the end of August to mid-September, we'll be doing the phase two Anovio DNA vaccine study then that study will end and then we're opening the phase three uh, Janssen, Johnson & Johnson's vaccine. So Pfizer's a messenger RNA, Novio DNA, and as you heard, the Janssen is an adeno 26. That's going to be a very large study for us. We're gonna be opening at five sites in Queens, Brooklyn, South NASA, Mount Sinai Hospital, and BI, um, and we're expected to enroll 2,000 patients. So it's a huge endeavor, but we, uh, you know, will be sending out notices and we'll send through GEPI as well for those people that may be interested in participating or know others that may participate. And I'll stop there so you can answer more important questions, but thank you. Okay, so the first question here is from Thomas Weber. Um, how important is the delivery route, um, intranasally versus uh, intramuscular? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it might be important. Um, most vaccines are actually given intramuscular. If you give a vaccine intramuscular, you mostly get an IgG response. Uh, and it's very hard to protect the upper respiratory tract uh, with that for specifically for some pathogens. Um, but again, there's nothing that is given uh, mucosally that is far up in the pipeline yet. I'm, I'm counting on Peter's vaccine, which uh, you know, is, is, uh, has a modality where you can give it ex actually intranasally. And that has been, has worked very well in mice and I hope uh, we will be able to test that in humans as well. But as you have seen, uh, the development of, of um, mucosal vaccines is really uh, lacking behind. Mm. 
Lily Wong, is the T cell response against ad 5 cov vaccine specific to adeno or to the corona spike protein? So what I showed was, was all uh, specific to the, the spike protein. Um, okay, next question um, is from Brad Rosenberg. Um, is Matrix M adjuvant currently used in any other licensed vaccine? Not to my knowledge, no. Ben Hur wants to know, has a question about Moderna data, but I'm not sure. He doesn't tell me what. Can you can you hear me? Yes, yeah. we can hear oh, you. Sorry. I, I, I can't multitask and type and listen at the same time, sorry. <laughs> um, that was a, a, a wonderful summary. Uh, it seems like the Moderna was one of the ones, if I'm reading your slides correctly, that's a bit more transparent because, well, it seems, uh, first of all, like the um, everything needs a second dose and the second dose gives a nice boost, you know, with, uh, amongst all the modalities. And um, the Moderna shows that the boost comes after like 28 days and then they had a 53-day time point which seems to be decreased. I can't tell whether that's significant or not. Do you have, do you have an opinion? I mean, it's, it's, um, that's the only data set that I saw that you know, shows, I guess, semi-long term. I'm, I'm not sure. It's very few people. I, I don't think you can, uh, you can really kind of you know, evaluate it based on that. Um, it might, um, there might be a slight, slight reduction, but I think um, they will look at that in, in uh, in more detail. Uh, I agree it would be nice to have uh, longer term data, but everybody was rushing to get their data out. And I think Moderna had the advantage that they started in April, so they probably had longer longer uh, follow-up data and the other ones started later, right? And you mentioned an important point that the good ones, at least the ones that you find are in the, I don't know, upper tier of what you find in convalescent uh, uh, plasma uh, uh, titles, because there's such a big range normally uh, in, in normal convalescent titers. And uh, um, what, you know, I, I, I guess is what the vaccine people should shoot for. Um, the ones that you mentioned were nice were in the top tier, right? Um, yeah, but we, again, we don't know what the protective titer is, right? Uh, it could be a 1 to 80. And then so it, can, you, can you tell us a bit more about how does one establish the correlates of protection you show in that very nice table? Was it after a big randomized like phase three and then they go back and see that, oh, these are the ones that correlate with protection or how, how does one go about it? I mean, that depends on when you do it, right? The HI data was basically a very messy study in the 70s that was established yeah. based on vaccinated, infected and so on and so forth with different uh, influenza B and I think H2. Uh, so the initial studies, and this is still something that is uh, accepted by the FDA, were very messy and not not very I wouldn't say very very uh, meth very nicely done right nowadays you would basically follow people look for a breakthrough determine a breakthrough titer and then uh, go from that right uh, so it would be probably done I'm not I'm not sure you would probably do an analysis from the phase three uh, and try to to get a, a number from the phase three. Uh, but in some cases, you might also need phase four data to get to 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 get a better idea about the about the data that correlates with protection. The problem that we'll get into is again that different companies will use different assays. Uh, these assays will be validated uh, by that company, but you might not be able to cross compare them uh, very easily. So I think that's going to be an issue in a way. We have a lot of other questions. I'd like to try to get one or two more if possible. So there is a question about, um, is there, from Katarina Hill, is there any thought about using Prime Boost with two different vaccine candidates? Yeah, so uh, I actually, that's what I would take if I would have, if I would be able to choose, I would probably take an Edna followed by the Novavax vaccine. Um, I don't, I'm not aware of any studies that are done with that right now. I can imagine that, uh, in that NIH, for example, would like to see something like that and would actually do that. I, I don't see that happening right now when everybody's racing to get their vaccine at the, on the market, but I can imagine that this will happen in the, in the next few months after the vaccine was licensed or after several vaccines were licensed. I think it's a good idea. Okay, our last question goes to Dr. Palesi. Um, do you have the mic, Peter? Uh, yes, I think I'm 
I want, I yeah. just want uh, to add to the very, very excellent talk by Florian and uh, on this optimistic note that we have really a lot of vaccines uh, in, in the pipeline, I think we, in contrast to other vaccines, even a lousy vaccine uh, against uh, COVID-19 may be very beneficial. I mean, if you think about an, an HIV vaccine, it's not good enough to just reduce the tide a little bit and uh, some other vaccines like hepatitis C, et cetera, we would need really sterilizing immunity. But in terms of COVID-19, if we could make the disease in a 75-year-old look like a 40-year-old, uh, I think we would all be very happy, or many of the more senior people would be very happy. So I just want to say that uh, I think we really have an optimistic message here. Uh, Florian pointed that out, but even a not 100% efficacy in a, vac in a COVID-19 vaccine might be a very, very big step forward. And I would like to leave you with this very positive and optimistic note. Well, thank you all. Thank you, Florian. Thank you all for, for your good questions and for listening. Bye. Thank you. Bye.